those of you who don't know me, my name is Jens. Um, I'm just this weird guy that they allow to speak here once in a while. Um, no, it's my honor and privilege. Pastor Nick asked if I would come and share. And um, not to get too far away from our theme, our theme has been over the months, Finding Jesus. And we've been looking through the Gospel of Luke and seeing how Jesus has, has come to life maybe in a new light so we can see what is happening and how we can understand Jesus better. Well, I thought, well, we covered the Christmas story earlier in the year through Luke, but we haven't covered it in Matthew. And you realize that finding Jesus is also a Christmas theme as well? And so I want to look at Matthew's account in his gospel, which Luke doesn't cover. And you see, the, and it talks about the wise men. I want to think about looking at the wise men's view of Christmas. Now, I, as you think about that, I have this question. What did it cost you this morning to come and worship? I mean, think about it. You got gas that you spend to drive in. Maybe you had to stop and get some coffee because you couldn't get the coffee here at church. Hmm. Maybe it cost you in how much sleep you could get. Uh, cost in your time because you maybe could be doing something. There's a, there's a lot of cost. But let's say, let's just say $25. It cost you $25 to come and worship. If that was the cost, would you do it? What if it was $50? Would you still come? What if the cost was your whole year's worth of vacation time and there's the cost of the expense to travel 700 miles away and then 700 miles back, not by car, but by foot and camel? Then would you do it? Well, we're going to talk about some guys who paid an enormous price to go and find and worship a king who was not part of their country. He was not part of their religion. He was not even part of their culture. And yet, they felt that it was worth it to go and find and worship this newborn king. So, if you would, take your Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. And turn to the first book in the New Testament, which is Matthew. Okay? And then we're going to turn to the second chapter in Matthew. And you'll know that the, chapter, the chapters are the big numbers that are in your Bible. That tells you what the chapter is. And we're going to read 1, verses 1 through 12. I'm actually going to read. So once you've found that, would you please stand up as we, I'm going to read and you read along in your Bible. I'll read and you re read silently. Here we go. Matthew 12, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem of the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men from secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another 
way. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, as we look into your word this morning, we confess that we come unable to really stand in your presence. We don't have an adequate quit gift to bring to you this morning. You've done everything for us, and so, Lord, the only thing we can bring is our thanksgiving gift and our gift of our own lives. And so, Lord, as we look into your word, stir our hearts, change our hearts, we invite you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I want to look at these wise men. And so if we could go to that first slide, I have some P words to describe what these wise men were going through. And the first thing we want to look at as we we go through this story is that the wise men prepared to meet a king. And so we know that they prepared because in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 2 it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, we, Matthew calls them wise men, but we, we, you probably know them from the song, we three kings disoriented are, wait, no, that's not the words, is it? No, actually, we sing about kings, but they weren't actually kings. They were actually wise men, or magi would have been the word. We're going to talk a little bit more about them, okay? But they were not kings. I suppose to the poor people in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, they would have appeared as kings because they would have seemed very wealthy. Where else, and this is a question I want you to answer, where else in the Old Testament does the Bible talk about men who were wise men? Anybody know? Daniel, yes, yes. Also, Proverbs does talk about it, but he's talking about wise people that do wise things, but actually men is in the book of Daniel. So you go back to Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel, listen, in, in, in chapter 2, verse 48, it says, Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel... He was the chief over all the wise men of Babylon. In fact, the wise men are, are, are referred to again in chapter 4 of Daniel and also in chapter 5 of Daniel. We're going to talk about the influence that Daniel had on these wise men. And it's, and it's interesting. So these men were not kings. They were magi. In fact, they probably were priests in the Zoroastrian religion that was in Persia. During that day, and the Persia would be in the Iraq, Iran area of the Middle East that we know today. So here's what, here's what the Imperial Bible Dictionary says about them. It says that Magi were of the tribe of the Medes who professed to interpret dreams and had the official charge of sacred rites. They were, in short, the learned and priestly class and having, as was supposed, the skill of deriving from books and the observation of the stars a supernatural insight into coming events. So in other words, these guys were scholars. They were book people. And, and they also studied the stars. And when they watched the stars and something new happened in the heavens, they're like, oh, something's happening on earth. Let's go and see. And so they would go through the readings and the prophecy that were written down. And they would figure out and they would, they would make a connection. And that's what these guys were doing. And so they weren't kings. They were magi. And they were probably priests of the Zoroastrian um, religion. I want you to notice, though, that these people, these men, were not part of of God's chosen people. They were not of Jewish descent. And yet, God was going to do a work in their hearts, and they would never be the same again. So these wise men, we, we learn that they saw a star in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. He says, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it has, has arose, and we've come to worship him. Now, why would they conclude that a new bright star in the sky would mean that there's a new king in Jerusalem. How did they do that? Ah, let's go back to Daniel. So when Daniel was alive, hundreds of years ago, he was in charge of all the wise men. 
Now, God had given Daniel specific visions and prophecy. In chapter 9, he told him a timetable of when the Messiah should come. And then these men, they probably had the scriptures with them because Daniel was also part of Babylon. They probably had a copy of the scriptures and maybe they found in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17 that says, a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Maybe putting those things together, they were wise men. They said, hmm, Daniel said that there was going to be coming a king. And the Old Testament said that there was going to be coming a king. There's a new star. Nay, there, this new king must have come. And you know, it's interesting, and we're going to go on and look at this, because a lot of people missed the fact that the star was going to say that. People that should have got it didn't get it. But I don't think it's just because these guys are wise men. I think... God helped them to put the things together so that they could understand it at the time. But get this. Think about the sovereignty of God. We all think about Daniel. Daniel being taken in from Jerusalem as a captive. He's led into Babylon as a teenager. We think, well, Daniel was taken to Babylon so he could preserve the Jewish nation so that eventually someday those people could come back and worship God again in Israel. That's true. But God had a greater plan. Hundreds of years later, Daniel's influence was going to come upon some wise men who were going to read his prophecy and look back in Scripture because of Daniel's influence, and they're going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to announce that the Messiah has come. God, don't limit God on what he can do. God, God's providence and, and his sovereignty is great and goes on for way longer than we would ever say. So, so don't sell God short. If you only think that you're doing, well, I'm only doing this small thing right now. You don't know what God has planned for that small thing years down the line. Just keep being faithful and doing it just as Daniel was faithful in doing it, what he was doing in serving God. And these wise men, they came in Jerusalem. They had seen the star. And what did they say? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They came to Jerusalem seeking a king, not just any king. They didn't come to see Herod. Herod was a great king. They didn't come to see Herod. They came to sing, find a newborn king, a king of the Jews. And it's interesting. They came to Jerusalem. Why did they go to Jerusalem? I used to think, when I was younger, I used to think, that obviously the star came up and the star kind of moved forward and they kept following it every night and it kept moving it towards Jerusalem. But that's not what I read in Scripture. Scripture says that the star arose and it appeared in the sky. It doesn't say anything about the star moving to Jerusalem, does it? And now it says later that it moves from Jerusalem to, to Bethlehem, but it doesn't say that it moved in that time. But listen, why did they go to Jerusalem? Because... Their conclusion was, a new king has been born, a new Jewish king. Where's the capital of Israel? Jerusalem. So, where would you go if you're going to find the new king in Israel? You're going to go to the capital. And so they show up into the capital, and they start asking around, where is the king who has been born king of the Jews? Where's this baby? How odd it must have been for them that no one knew what they were talking about. And you know what? These wise men, they didn't just come to find a king. They stated the purpose of why they came. What was their planned purpose? Their purpose was, we have seen a star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. They didn't just come to see this newborn king. They understood the nature of this newborn king. They came to worship him. I mean, they traveled a long time to worship and they they were not just going to be spectators it's not just like yeah we went to jerusalem we saw jesus you know it's they weren't just looking for somebody famous if they wanted to do that they could have gone and saw herod and said yeah we went to herod we saw his palace man the temple that he's building is amazing no that's not what they did they came to worship the newborn king of the jews i believe they understood that this new king was more than just an earthly king. 
They came to worship him because they understood that this baby is the king, the one foretold by the prophets and the holy scriptures. He is the Christ, the Messiah. In fact, we know that because Herod concluded the same thing after their questioning. And then how were the wise men? How did they plan and prepare to worship him? Well, we know in verse 11, they brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And now, just think, they didn't pick these gifts up at the dollar store on the way. You know, they're going to the Christmas party, we better bring a gift with us, better stop at the dollar store. Or, no, we went into King Herod's gift shop, you know, and got the, no, that's not it. These are kingly gifts that they prepared ahead of time to bring with them. Gold, gold is easy to see as a kingly gift. I mean, poor people like Mary and Joseph, they would never have gold. Only kings deserve to be given a gift of gold. And I'm sure that gold became super handy when they had to flee from Bethlehem to, to go to, to Egypt to escape Herod's persecution and trying to kill Jesus. And so gold was an important gift for them to receive. But they gave frankincense. Now frankincense is a resin that comes from the Boswellia tree and it was prized for its lovely fragrance. But not only that, it had medicinal purposes as well. It was used to kill some types of bacteria and fungi. It was also a strong immune system booster, and it had anti-inflammatory effects on the body. But mostly we know frankincense because it is the perfume of kings. And myrrh, it was also a resin from a tree. It's from the Camophoria tree. And it was used in the temple, um, the, in the recipe that they used in the temple incense that was only burned in the, in the temple, that, that had uh, myrrh in it, but it was also used in the embalming process for a person that had passed away. And they would wrap that body up and they would include these, the myrrh into the spice and it probably helped to cover the stink as the body decayed. But at the time when Jesus was born, it was thought that myrrh was probably just as valuable as gold. So these were costly gifts. And so as you're thinking about this, and now we're thinking about these men who were going to worship the newborn king, their worship was costly. It cost them something. It cost them in their gifts. Well, the next thing I want to look at is how the wise men persevered to find the king. I mean, think about it. They traveled from Babylon area, probably 400 to 700 miles to get just to Jerusalem. And if they truly came from Babylon, if you look on Google Maps and you find where Babylon was and you kind of do their route around, it's like 714 miles just to get to Jerusalem. Now, a lot of times we think, okay, there was just three guys traveling with their camels. You know, no, that wasn't, that, that's the wrong picture, okay? They probably traveled in a very big caravan because Three guys traveling with gold, frankincense, and myrrh would be robbed and killed, right? No, no, no. These probably, they had probably had lots of servants, lots of animal keepers. They had soldiers that were there guarding them as they were going. It was a big group of people. And you know what? It took, we, it took months to get there. In fact, we know if we read in the Old Testament that when um, Ezra came with a party of people from Babylon to Jerusalem, it took them four months to get there. And so the amount of travel time, it was months for these people. And they didn't probably just ride camels all the time. They probably walked a lot as well. And so it was expensive. It was costly, not just the gifts that they brought. It was costly just to get into the king's presence. It cost the money to, to do the preparation. It cost their time. It cost their effort. It probably cost their reputation. Think about it. Here they are. They are Zoroastrian priests in Persia, preparing to take a trip to Israel based upon what? The fact that they saw this bright star up in the sky. And they've gathered all these supplies, all these people. They've got these expensive gifts. And what do you think the Persians are thinking about this as they see all this is happening? I mean, wait, why would they even care about a new Jewish priest? It doesn't make sense. And they said, well, we're going to worship this new king, this Jews, who's been born. I think he's an important king. I bet you at some point they probably felt a lot like Noah, who was out in his backyard building a boat because a flood was coming from the rain and it had never rained before. Probably the same feeling. 
And here these guys were preparing to go and worship a new king. Are you starting to see that was costly for these men to go and worship the Messiah? And I bet you they were pretty perplexed at the response of the people as they started asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They started asking this around. And they probably weren't received very well either as they were asking this. What do you mean? We only have one king here in Jerusalem, and his name is Herod. If you go trying to look for a new king, you're going to be in trouble, and you're just going to cause trouble. And I'd be quiet if I were you. And I can see them just gathering back together after they went out searching, and they're like, wait a second. What's going on? It's like, it's like they have no idea what we're talking about. Imagine how confused the, the, the Magi must have been. I mean, that star that they saw was so bright in the night sky. How could anybody have missed seeing that? The baby must have come, yet no one knows anything about it. How can it be? Maybe they had doubts. Maybe they thought, did we make a mistake? Did we not really get the message that God was, that was being said in the stars? Maybe it's the wrong star. Maybe Daniel's prophecy wasn't true. Well, it's really interesting that the people who should have understood the message of the star missed it all together. Well, Herod, when he heard the news, it did cause trouble. Because if you go down to verse 3, it says this, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. You know, when the, that, that word troubled was probably an understatement there. You see, if you're going to cause King Herod trouble, or you're going to cause this, you were going to disturb King Herod, you could probably lose your head. He did not want to be, you did not want to disturb this king. Because when you disturbed Herod, you didn't know how he was going to react. He was unpredictable and at the very best. I mean, he killed his own kids just to protect himself. And so, you know, he, no one around saw the possibility that the Messiah had come. And isn't that interesting? They had been waiting for this Messiah in Jerusalem for hundreds of years, and here you got some men coming, where's the Messiah? Where's the Messiah? And they're like, what are you talking about? We only have one king, and that's Herod. They, they, they didn't get it. Well, we're going to go on, because the wise men are going to prove the truth of the king. They came looking. Where is the king? We saw his star. You know that bright star that everyone had seen. Scripture foretold about it. It was in your own scriptures that he was coming. It's interesting. Herod understood, like I said, they were talking about the Christ, the Messiah, but the people missed the message. You remember when we were studying Luke and Jesus Jesus was in his own town and he reads to them the prophecy of Isaiah and he says to them, today this has been fulfilled. I'm here. And he says, but you're not going to get it. It was the same way back in the Old Testament when Elijah needed protection. Where did he go? There were a lot of widows in Israel, but God sent him to Sidon, to the widow in Sidon. And there was a lot of people with leprosy in Elisha's day, but who got healed from leprosy? This Assyrian general named Naaman. And when the people heard that, what was their reaction? They took Jesus out, out of the synagogue. They took him to the edge of the cliff. They were going to throw him off the cliff. You see, they missed the message, the meaning of who Jesus was and how he was foretold in Scripture. And here with the wise men, they're from Persia. And they're another example of how the Jewish people just did not get what God was doing. I mean, think about the Jewish people. They had the same sign. The star was there. They had the same scriptures. In fact, they had people who were dedicated to just studying and teaching those scriptures. And yet, they missed it. They missed it. And you know they knew scriptures because when Herod asked them, okay, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? I don't think they had to go and, and look in their scrolls. I bet you somebody just popped up and, and said, oh, oh, Micah 5 too. They actually didn't have chapters and verse back then. Micah, the book of Micah, it says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. It's in Bethlehem, king. I'm sure they had that right on their tongue and could tell him that. 
Isn't it interesting? Just like John tells us over in John chapter 1. It says, John says this about Jesus, that he came to his own, but his own people did not what? They did not receive him, did they? They were not looking and ready for their Messiah. Well, the priests and scribes, they correctly interpreted the right scripture. They had all the answers, but they missed the meaning and the message. I don't really think they were really looking for the Messiah. <laughs> it's interesting. Where was the Messiah? He was only five miles away from them in Bethlehem. Why, and I, I, in their own mind, though, I can understand this. Why would God send these filthy Gentile dogs, these Persians, to tell us, his chosen people, that his messenger or his Messiah has come? They couldn't understand that. They could never get that, could they? I guess they missed the message of the shepherds that were only five miles away that the Messiah had come. Hey, angels announced it, but somehow... That message didn't get all the way to Jerusalem. And they missed the message of Simeon. And the priestess Anna, they missed those messages who announced that Jesus, had, the Messiah, had come. They didn't listen. They didn't hear that either. And it's really interesting to me that the Bible says nothing that they didn't even say, hey, we should probably send somebody to Bethlehem out to see if something's true about this. It doesn't say anything about that at all, does it? Well, Herod did not want the Messiah to come to power. Nope, his family was very happy ruling Israel. Rome had given them the authority to rule Israel and they were really happy, his family dynasty. He had children that were in line and he wanted everything to continue. We don't need a Messiah. He thought it was a myth, kind of like Santa Claus or Easter Bunny. We don't need that Messiah thing here. We got me, the, the Herods are ruling. He did not want that to happen. And so what did he do about it? Well, it says in verse 7, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring the word to me, so I too may come and worship him. <laughs> Herod, he meets with them secretly. Why would you meet with someone secretly? Because you have evil intent. When you have evil intent, you don't do it out in plain sight. You do it secretly. He was already scheming, how can I destroy this upstart that says he's going to be king? And so he asked, he asked the wise men, hey, when did that star first appear? He's trying to figure out how old the baby is. And that'll tell him what, what age child do they need to kill, to get rid of, to destroy and then he tells them this. He says, listen, hey, I got it. He's over in Bethlehem. It's only five miles away. You guys, you guys go over there and you search for him. Make a careful search. And when you find him, come back and let me know so I too can go and worship him. Ha. Now, I, these guys were wise men. I know they probably saw through Herod's intentions, okay? It, well, it probably was not their first rodeo, and uh, it wasn't the first time they had seen intrigue in, in the palace courts. I'm sure it's not much different in Persia. And so they're like, yeah, right. Mm. And so, but Herod sends them the right direction, and they go to Bethlehem. And what does it say here in the scripture? That as soon after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it arose went before them. So it sounds to me like the star necessarily had, maybe hadn't even been seen, and they were only going by faith in what they had seen in that star. And now here is the star again. And what is the star to? It goes before them. And it rests over the place where the child was. And then you jump down to verse 11 and going into the house. Now, just so you understand, the star didn't stop over a stable. Okay? Just, just so you know, it didn't stop over a stable because 
they, uh, they showed up on the scene months after Jesus was born. And Mary and Joseph didn't live in the stable either. They lived in a house by then, okay? So they had found a house and they were living in a house. Now I find it interesting that the star could actually move and they could understand it. So it, let's say that God picked something like the North Star. Now, if the North Star moved, that would be amazing. But I can't see how they would pick out one house following just... That one star, whatever. Oh, it's got to be that house. Well, you change your perspective. Oh, it must be that house. Somehow this star moved so that they knew it was this house. And in this house was where the Christ child was. It was an amazing thing. It was God-ordained, and it was a miracle that it happened. And what was their response to this? What was their response to this? There's, the wise men began to praise the king, when they saw the star, says in verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It wasn't like, yay, we finally made it. No, 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 no. These guys are having a full-out Pentecostal moment here, okay? It's just like, it's like their team had just won the Super Bowl, the World Series, the World Cup, and got a gold medal all in the same moment. I mean... I could just picture them. They're jumping up and down. They're hugging one another. We made it. Finally, he's here. Can you believe it? Months. They've been working at this for months, preparing for months, traveling for months, and they finally get to the place where they can worship. And what do they do? It says in verse 11, And when they, going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Literally, they probably went down and prostrated themselves, put their face on the ground. These are important people. It would be like having our president come in to a baby and the most important people are our, our, our speaker of the house, and they would bow down. And wouldn't this be great? <laughs> and they would, they would humble themselves before a baby. Unbelievable. But listen, when they saw the Christ child, I'm sure that they were overwhelmed, and they humbled themselves. You see, if we're going to worship, you have to to humble yourself, to worship. So you have to ask the question, is our worship, our, do we humble ourselves when we come to worship our king? And not only did they humble themselves this way, when they, when they, they got up and then they got to their treasures and they brought out their gifts, the kingly gifts of gold, of frankincense, of myrrh, kingly gifts to give to a child. And then, to end the story, what happens then? After being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed and went to their own country by another way. So the wise men parted from the king. You see, I think if they would have went back to Herod, they probably would have lost their lives because there was no way Herod was going to let some people walk around saying, hey, you're Messiah, he's over in Bethlehem, he's at this house, house number 44 on Maple Street, you can go over and see him. He's right there. They probably wouldn't say that. They wouldn't be saying that. <laughs> Don't laugh. I see you guys laughing. I just talked. That's Dave's house. <laughs> but you see, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. And, and they probably would be telling people. Herod couldn't have that. He probably would have killed him. So God warned them in a dream. Don't go back to Herod. Herod doesn't want to come worship this kid. Herod wants to destroy this child. You need to go back to Persia a different way. You know what? They listened and they obeyed. And, and I'm sure as they parted from there, they probably had the same feeling as Simeon had after he had seen the Messiah. Maybe on their words, maybe they had this in, in verse 23, or it says, um, verse 30, For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, not just for the Jews, for the whole world. They had seen and beheld and worshipped the newborn king. And I'm just going to close this quickly. I'm going to draw to this conclusion and take a look at how should we worship this king. 
I want you to know that when they worshipped, these wise men worshipped, it was a humble worship. Their worship was not about them, but about the object of their worship. It was about the Christ child. Look at their posture, remember? Their posture was they came in and they fell flat on their face. Now, my expectation is when you come into church that we're not necessarily called to walk in and fall down on our face. But I tell you what, you read through scripture, anybody who came into the presence of a holy being, their reaction was to fall down on their face. Okay? So, what I am saying is when we come to worship, we need to have humble attitudes in our hearts. We need to see ourselves in light of who God and Christ our Savior is. You see, to worship God means that you fear God. I'm not saying, child of God, that you need to be afraid that you are going to be destroyed. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you need to be in awe and wonder of who he is and what he has done for you. You and I don't deserve the mercy and grace that we get so freely that God gives to us. And he gave it to us at his own cost. We can understand if we start to think about that, how the, how, how the psalmist says, Who is man that you are mindful of him, God? Who am I that God is mindful of me? So as we come to worship, we need to worship with a humble attitude. And their worship was costly. We already talked about that. How about you this morning? How costly is your worship? What did you bring that was costly for the Savior, your King, this morning? I'm not talking about what gift you're going to put in that little wooden box back there. See, you don't come to worship the king to get what you want out of worship. That's not worship. Worship is about what we bring to God. It's not what God can give to us. We don't want to We don't want to just give any old thing either. We want to give something costly. So what do you have that's costly this morning? Well, I'll tell you what's costly. Your very own life. Jesus said this, whoever wants to live needs to, if a man wants to find life, first he must do what? He must lose it. So when we lose our lives to Christ, it's an act of worship. Jim Elliott said this. Jim Elliott was a missionary to the Aka Indians in Ecuador, and he lost his life to try and bring them the message of salvation, the gospel. He said this, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let me say that again. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Mr. Elliott, he was talking about true worship there. So our worship needs to be humble. Our worship should be costly. What do we give? And then our worship should also be Christ-exalting. When those wise men came, they did not come to worship Jesus' mother Mary. They did not come to worship Jesus' earthly father Joseph. They were really wonderful, great people, but they didn't come to worship them. They didn't come to worship the house where Jesus was in. They didn't come to worship the town where Jesus was in. They came for one purpose and one purpose only, to worship the Christ, the newborn king. The one, the only king of the Jews, the one foretold hundreds of years ago that they had finally found him. And sometimes I wonder if we get more caught up in different things in our worship. Maybe we get caught up in the where we worship. I mean, really. Pews, and they pick the chairs, and then they took the chairs, they turned the chairs, so now we're not all facing that. Boy, really upsets me. (laughs) Maybe we get caught up in the how we worship. Did you like the songs that we sang today? I keep singing those songs, and... I don't know. They, they repeat the same words over and over again. Why can't we go back to singing songs like Bach used to write in Handel? You know, songs like Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Talk about repeating words over and over again. 
You know, we get caught up in that. Maybe it's the wind we worship. Why nine o'clock? I mean, you're, you're crouching into my sleeping time. I like the 11 o'clock service. I could just sleep as much as I want to and get up and stroll into church when I was ready. Maybe it's the who. I can't listen to him. He just doesn't speak like I want him to. You know, I know it's God's word, but it's delivered by this other guy, and it's, he's just not my type. When you think about those perspectives on worship, whose perspectives are those? Those are our perspectives. That's not worship. Worship is not about our perspective. Worship is not about our desires. True worship is not about us at all. It's about the one that we come to worship. That's what worship was all about. And I just want to say one more thing about worship. Here's my fourth point, that worship is not an obligation. God does not want your worship because you feel obligated to do so. God wants you to desire to worship from your heart as a response, a love response back to him for what he has done for you and who he is. You know, he has done everything for you so that you can freely worship in spirit and truth. Jesus died so that you can freely come to God with no barriers, no rules, and no trapping. He's done everything. You only need to come and worship him by faith, believing that Jesus is God, that he died for your sins, and that he came back to life again. And once you've done that act of worship, all those other things are going to fall into place. But that's the place to start in true worship. And you know, I think when those wise men in all their splendor, in all their glory, when they came into that humble house with those poor parents and that baby, you know, I bet you any money that they were overwhelmed and they felt poor themselves and inadequate when they came into the presence of God and his grace. The songwriter had it right, and he, he invites us this. He says, come and behold him. Born the king of angels, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. That's worship. When we come and we adore the one, the only King of the universe, Christ. Well, this morning, there's another way that we're going to worship together.